Hey everybody, Josh Sirtson, World Alternative Media here, and what are these bags? Are they bags? Why on earth are they depicted in nearly every historical culture? In this video, we are going to dig into the strange appearance of these handbags, or whatever they are, throughout the world. I think it's a conspiracy by Gucci, guys. Welcome to another show on lost ancient civilizations where we break down the hidden histories of mankind. As people like Graham Hancock says, we are a species with amnesia. In far too many cases, instead of attempting to understand the apparent cyclical nature of mankind throughout the ages, many in mainstream academia go out of their way to prove their bias rather than explore new ideas. This need to cling to old ideas has naturally led to so many missed opportunities to truly find out the origins of so many ancient civilizations and cultures, as well as inadvertently lead millions of people, including many of you watching this video, to be forced to think outside the box and do this kind of research yourself. It's like the Barbara Streisand effect. As we've spoken of so many times before here at WAM, including in our recent documentary on the reshot structure in Mauritania, there's evidence that ancient cultures around the world have gotten a helping hand from some kind of sophisticated earlier civilization with vast knowledge. Knowledge far greater than that which we possess today. Well, at least far greater than the knowledge we as individuals possess. Who knows what some secretive groups throughout the world are aware of. But that's a question for another day. As we've broken down in past videos, hundreds of ancient civilizations around the world have almost the same story of a great flood or cataclysm destroying most life on Earth. From Gilgamesh to Noah, from Vishnu to Osiris and Adam, from China and Australia to dozens of North American cultures, including the Incas, Aztecs, Mayans, and passed down from the Olmecs. The stories are slightly different, enough to have their own cultural footprint, but similar in enough ways that it seems to tip us off to some sort of helping hand. A historical game of telephone, if you will. Of 86 flood stories studied by researchers, 62 of them had no connection to Babylonian or Hebrew accounts. Interestingly, they all appear to have happened around the age of Plato's Atlantis. They all seem to match to a timeline around the end of the Younger Dryas period, the last ice age. They all seem to connect to the time of Gobekli Tepe. We'll go deeper into that in a moment, and by the way, if anyone is interested, I will be heading to Gobekli Tepe in September to do some on-the-ground research. Any help is appreciated, and there are links below where you can contribute to help me along in my journey, bringing you this free information. Anyways, we see Osiris who was seen in animal form as a serpent god and in human form with his beard and robe leave Egypt close to the time of Zeptepe, or the first time as the dynastic Egyptians called it. He left for the west to teach civility, agriculture, architecture, language, all sorts of stuff. Well, in this same distant epoch, we hear the Mayans, Aztecs, and Incas talk about Viracocha and slash or Quetzalcoatl coming from the east over the sea with a long robe and a white beard and light skin in human form, or associated with a serpent, if not a serpent himself, in animal form. They came to these cultures to bring civility, agriculture, architecture, language, etc. to the people of the land. The Central and South Americans worshipped this now deified entity for so long that the stories passed down over possibly thousands of years of this intelligent entity to the point where the Spanish invaded the mainland Americas and the Aztecs, Mayans, and Incas, who could have easily won in a battle with them, saw the light skin and threw down their weapons only to be slaughtered much of their history being destroyed soon after by the Spanish, who 
deemed them satanic. Osiris returned to Egypt and was killed soon after. Horus brought a great cataclysm unto mankind, but that gets off the main point here. My point is, the similarities are alarmingly close. It makes one wonder if these entities were truly gods or if they were just deified by a populace of initially hunter-gatherers who were witnessing the remnants of a technologically savvy society spread their message. If one of us went to an untouched landmass in the Amazon and found a tribe that had never seen outsiders and then started playing with our iPhone, they would see us as either gods or demons. <laughs> we would hope gods for the sake of our own lives. Now, if there's an apocalypse or great cataclysm, the technologically savvy would do the worst as far as survival goes. They'd want to live among the hunter-gatherers, right? It makes sense that this is exactly what they would do. We live among hunter-gatherers today, it's likely that these lost ancient civilizations of the past did as well. It's not as black and white as it having to be one type of human civilization or another. Now, as I mentioned, all of these ancient legends, including Atlantis, tend to fit into the time frame of the Younger Dryas period. A period of time with rapid weather changes and intense, hellish cataclysms a time period that wasn't proven to a science until the past 10 years thanks to core samples, the Younger Dryas boundary seen in soil around the world, water levels along the coasts, evidence of plasma bursts as well as a recently found Hiawatha crater in Greenland which we've reported on in depth on this channel before. Is it a coincidence that all of these storylines match up? Now. Add to it the aging of the Great Sphinx and how geologists like Dr. Robert Schock have proven that the Sphinx has water erosion around the enclosure that could not have happened in the time frame that mainstream academics claim it was built in. Thousands of years of rainwater damage on the enclosure as well as on the body. The body that shows signs of renovations going back as far as around the dynastic times it was supposedly built in. Tell me how that makes any sense. It was so heavily eroded soon after being built that they patched it up? This is nonsense. Not to mention the least weathered part of the Sphinx, the head, was one of the only parts of the Sphinx exposed to the elements in the past few thousand years. And there's great evidence the head was whittled down from the original head, which many theorize was the dog Anubis. Many also claim it's a representation of Leo, which uh, would make sense based on the astrological position the Sphinx is in as it faces due east towards constellation Leo in the year 10,500 BC, which is around the time frame Dr. Robert Schock theorizes the Sphinx's age based on weathering. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. We can get into the astrological alignments of the Great Pyramids with Orion and the Sphinx as well as countless other places around the world connected to the stars in a time when people weren't supposed to possess such knowledge. We can get into that another time. For now, let's get to those damn bags. <laughs> so we have this time frame all coming together here. Now, for years, the notion of civilizations existing before 3000 BC around the time of Stonehenge was considered nonsense. It was considered incredibly fringe when John Anthony West and Robert Schock came out with their findings in the early 1990s. When Graham Hancock published the book Fingerprints of the Gods, the theory blew up in the mainstream and caused many loud arguments among academics. Whether they should stick to their preconceived viewpoints dated to the early 1800s or if they should change their minds over new evidence presented. Huh, the way science is supposed to work? At this time, the Younger Dryas was also considered to be fringe. It's not anymore. Then everything changed when Klaus Schmidt discovered Gobekli Tepe, an ancient site that predated Stonehenge by around 7,000 years. This site is dated conservatively to the 10th millennia, around 9,100 BC at the lowest point so far excavated. Most of the site remains underground to this day in Turkey's San Liurfa province. 
Interestingly, the lower you dig, the more impressive and large the stonework is. Those who had built it in the 10th millennia repeatedly built these T-shaped stone pillars and then buried them over and over again in a time frame where people weren't supposed to even know how to farm. Mainstream academics did whatever they could to make sense of this puzzle, which they were forced to accept the dating of. They claim it as somewhat of an anomaly, a random megalithic structure built as a temple by hunter-gatherers who one day decided to throw down their spears and build this massive site that dwarfs Stonehenge. They carved out sophisticated imagery on these stones. Then one day they decided to bury it and wait five or six thousand years before suddenly building once again the most impressive structures mankind has ever created. Then getting more and more primitive as time went on following these great marvels. Does this make any sense to you? Well that brings us to the bags and we'll get back to Gobekli Tepe in a moment. Ancient Egyptians drew and carved images of their gods carrying strange bags. So did the Babylonians and Sumerians. So did the Hebrews. Strangely, so did people in Ecuador, as we see in the Father Crespi collection of ancient artifacts given to him by local natives. Most impressively, so did the Olmecs. So did the Mayans, Aztecs, and Incas to an extent. In many cases, the gods are both of a bird species and also attempting to place some pine cone type object into something or tending to a tree. In the Olmec case, the entity is seemingly driving some kind of reptilian vehicle. This bag is everywhere and those examples alone are crazy enough, but then we see in a far older epoch in Gobekli Tepe the existence of the same bag on top of a T-shaped pillar above a bird holding the earth. The whole stone seems to contain astrological symbology once again in a time when people were not supposed to have such knowledge. Yet the mathematical alignment data that people like author Andrew Collins has done tends to show Gobekli Tepe matched perfectly to the Cygnus constellation, which tends to assume a vastly sophisticated understanding of the stars. And I can't go without noting the presence of the bags in the United States around the earthquake-prone Ridgecrest, California, at the Coso Rock Art District, thought to be around 10,000 years old, but possibly much older, due to many of the out-of-place species of animals drawn at the large site. Now, there are countless theories regarding these bags. Many believe it's some form of alien technology, perhaps some kind of communication device, but I'm not sure about that. If less sophisticated people were to draw an image of something they don't understand or comprehend, whether we can use our iPhones again as an example, thousands of years down the line, people will lack comprehension even more so regarding the nature of the object in question. Many people theorize the bags are time portals or dimensional portals, but this lacks literal evidence. We can theorize about ley lines and the possibility of utilizing energetic frequency to do amazing things, but we should not assume such a far out theory without proper data. What we are emotionally attached to and what is factually accurate are usually two different things, but again, these are all theories. Many believe these bags are batteries, like the Baghdad battery, and that they produce power. Primitive power, but power nonetheless. This is more likely, but I'm still not convinced. We've talked about the power that the Great Pyramids possess to concentrate electromagnetic frequency. And I'm a believer in the pyramid power plant theory to an extent, which I've gone over in past videos, including my most recent reshot structure documentary. But again, there's no linking association necessarily. So this theory remains just a theory for now as does the rest, but not a very convincing one. Graham Hancock believes that they could have carried the stash of the gods. As in, he believes that they could have contained ayahuasca or DMT, as many ancients are pictured picking from the tree of life as well as holding these bags. 
The tree of life in some cultures studied by botanists appears to show the correct plant culture to contain DMT, which is considered one of the most mind-boggling, mind-opening psychedelics on the planet. Joe Rogan never stops talking about it as a matter of fact. Now, this theory could be true and it could be linked to the spirit molecule theories. But again, there's just not enough information to prove such a theory. Finally, there's a theory that I kind of like the best having read into dozens of other theories. It's the theory that it's a cultural reference to the gods on the ground and the heavens above. Of course, most of these ancient gods were said to have come from the stars. However we can spin that story, I don't care to assume. But Osiris was matched with Orion's belt, which of course the Great Pyramids, among countless other amazing structures throughout the world, are perfectly matched to. The ancients depicted the heavens often as an arch, kind of like a dome. This dome can also be depicted in ancient Egypt among the gods of Heliopolis. Meanwhile, the square base of the so-called bag would represent the earth itself, heaven and earth. So in ancient cultures around the east and to some extent in the west, civilizations used circles to represent the spirit or non-matter, ideas and soul. The earth itself, on the other hand, the physical being was a square. So if you consider this arch and this square combined in the hands of the gods, it can be considered a reunification of heaven and earth, of what one may consider as material and non-material binded together. This also makes one consider Gobekli Tepe, where a bird is holding a sphere or circle above its wing, below these bags. Interestingly, many of the depictions of the bag show a bird creature holding it, and it does seem to connect in a roundabout sort of way to Thoth of Egypt, as a teaching of wisdom. So the pillar could be pertaining to heaven and earth in the hands of the gods, or it could be depicting the circle I spoke of earlier, representing non-material things alongside the heaven and the earth in the hands of the gods. In many cases, the deity is also taking from or tending to a tree which has been matched multiple times to the biblical and Babylonian tree of life. So it's tending to the tree of life with heaven and earth in its hands. The watch looking thing could be representative of the ancient depiction of the flower of life as well. Now we're overloading with symbolism. The flower of life is often associated with the Illyrian tribe, uh, though tends to pop up in numerous cultures. Uh, this theory makes the most sense to me. There was a lost ancient civilization, or many of them for that matter. Their ideas were passed around like a game of telephone. Religious symbology, especially regarding the heaven and earth, were carried over from culture to culture. The images were passed down through the ages. The gods were as well, but the bags stayed closer to their true origins, while gods changed ever so little over time. The helping hand we hear people like Graham Hancock talk about. I think this theory is quite brilliant and I have to credit Laird Scranton for this theory, which I've slightly added to. So what I'm bringing to your attention may not be proof of technology in itself among the ancients, but the passing down from a more technologically savvy civilization, symbology that people are just starting to pick up on today. You compare civilizations from around the world and they are ridiculously similar with slight differences that seem to show a gap in actual connection with each other, but rather a helping hand passing down information and the historical game of telephone taking hold. This seems most likely. The symbology of the stars has been in question for eons. The theory that astrology has only existed and the symbols of Pisces, Taurus, and the rest came to be in a more recent epoch is void of recent findings where it's quite clear that pre-biblical civilizations possessed astrological knowledge and utilized it for everything from measurements to religion. It's interesting because this could point to this astrological symbology being one of the oldest remnants of human symbolism and psychology that exists today. 
Astrology and the symbology that comes with astrology may be vastly old. It could be tens of thousands of years old, and I find that truly incredible. Now, as for the bird gods existing on both sides of the world, that's just creepy, and I have no idea how that came to be, other than that symbology also matching to a distant pre-cataclysm epoch passed down over the millennia. But that's a question for another day. Now, I will say that I could be completely wrong. The bag in many depictions does look like a legitimate bag, and the arch may not be properly representative of the heaven symbology among many cultures. In some cases, it does appear more as a strap than anything. In some depictions, the square is more of a circular or upside-down uh, dome-like shape could be slightly manipulated, uh, passed down knowledge connecting to the theory I presented previously, or it could actively debunk the theory I'm bringing to you. Uh, it could represent a more non-materialistic Earth or a variation of Earth with another land or dimension. Any of this is technically possible. Honestly, it could be high technology and it could be a bag of some type of mind-altering drug. It could be alien technology, depicted by far more simple people, and the wristwatch could literally be some kind of communication device, or a quartz watch. Who knows? None of us truly know. But I'm just looking at what I believe is the most likely theory. Either way, I'm going to be called both crazy and a shill, so that's fine. We can all make our own decisions about these theories. When I say I'm confident with the theory I've presented, I mean I'm about 40% confident with it, which makes it uh, the most likely scenario in my mind. I'm just trying to be objective, but one of the things I love about this subject matter is that there's so much more to learn that we're all likely to be wrong more than right, which gives us a great learning curve to dive into. And as I'm sure most of you relate, I love to learn new things, especially regarding the ancient hidden secrets of mankind, or whatever these ancient deities were. Anunnaki? I don't know. But I think that does it for today's breakdown. We will be traveling to many sites around Turkey in September, as well as throughout much of Western Europe in August uh, to report on ancient sites and more localized news stories. We are starting to plan out our adventures to ancient sites in 2020, and I'm hoping to get to Iraq, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Peru, and Bolivia. So let us know what you want to see us report on and help us out any way you can. I've gone bankrupt doing this, but only because I have a passion for bringing you all this information for free. So any help is seriously appreciated. We can't do any of this without you. Check the links below if no one is willing to go to so-called dangerous places to examine and document ancient marvels. I'll do it. Your pledge puts feet on the ground at these incredible sites around the world. I told you I'd go to Mauritania and I did, right? Certainly nothing can be as daunting as sleeping in a border town hostel with cockroaches on my face. Or could it? Anyway, thank you so much for watching, everyone. And until next time, this is Josh Sirritson signing out from World Alternative Media. Find the truth, be the change. Like what you see here, OM? Don't forget to check the links below. GoFundMe, Patreon, we can't do it without you. Any donation is very much appreciated as we are so heavily demonetized and shadow banned to a crazy extent. We have lost about 80% of our reach since the beginning of this year as they rip away subscribers, etc. It has gotten out of control and it's becoming more and more difficult to stay alive here on World Alternative Media, bringing you guys free content every day. You can also check our Bitcoin address in the description as well as on the screen for you to scan if you please and also check us out on all these other alternatives like Subscribestar where we are doing subscriber only content for people at the $4.99 US dollar a month tier and up we really appreciate it you could tip us on there and pledge anything but uh, from $4.99 and up we are giving people subscriber only content that you won't find here on YouTube. And speaking of YouTube, there are so many alternatives for YouTube these days, including uh, BitChute, which we are on at World Alternative Media, as well 
as of course the new float.app, F-L-O-T-E dot A-P-P, where they are truly replacing all of these social medias, including Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Tumblr, Reddit, and of course, Twitch and Patreon all in one place and it's truly incredible what they are doing. We are moving over there in mass as well as BitChute, BitTube, uh, Steemit at Josh Searson, all those other places as well as PocketNet we are on as well at World Alternative Media. There's so many options today and we're trying to get into as many of them as possible because we need to back ourselves up. We are winning this information war, but we are getting to a point where they are cracking down more desperately than ever, and we gotta do whatever we can to stay alive as it's getting more and more difficult all the time. We also have events coming up, including Anarchadelphia 2019, which will be in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in September. Uh, check out the stateofanarchy.com and anarchadelphia.com. Link below, use promo code WAM, W-A-M, and save 10% on your tickets to this amazing conference as Anarchy is going viral. Also, make sure to check out the Winnipeg Crypto Conference in October. Also, use promo code WAM, another great event with amazing speakers, and of course, Anarchapalco, the one and only, in February 2020, which you can also use promo code WAM for WAM and save 10%. There's so many things that you can do to help independent media, including just pressing like, sharing, clicking the notification button, doing whatever you can to help keep this free information alive that's alternative to the mainstream. Anyway, until next time, thanks for watching everyone. This is Josh Sheridan signing out from World Alternative Media. Find the truth, be the change. I'm sure you have already changed people's minds in your young age because you're involved and I like that. Wow, 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 wow.